Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 through 21, and it's about Jesus rejected in Nazareth. <clears throat> Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And that ends our scripture reading for the morning. So in our scripture for today, we find Jesus at the start of his ministry. And if you've kind of caught on to the series that we've been going through, we've really been focused on the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Now, from week to week, if you kind of remember back, we've uh, looked at his baptism and temptation in the desert. And now he's begun traveling around the country, going into different synagogues and teaching on the Sabbath. And on this day, he comes back to the town of Nazareth, the town that he was raised in. And he goes into the synagogue and reads to them scriptures from Isaiah, Isaiah that tell them what the Messiah will do. And Jesus sits down after reading it. I almost like imagine it as a first century mic drop almost. Rolls up the scroll, gives it to the guy, sits back down. But then they're all looking at him, and he says to them, guess what? What I just read to you, that's going to happen right now. And it's even happening right now today because I am the one that Isaiah was talking about. Now, what did the people do when they hear this? Did they rejoice? Did they say, I knew it? I knew there was something special about Mary and Joseph's son. Did they fall down and praise God for delivering to them the Messiah that had been wait, they had been waiting for for all of these years? Well, if you know the story, if you're listening in the, the children's message this morning, you know that the answer to that question of what did they do, uh, but just in case you didn't catch it, the answer is no, that is not what they did when Jesus was preaching to them in Nazareth. They did not do any of those things. In fact, the people of Nazareth became enraged by the words that Jesus was saying. They got so angry that they chased him to the top of a cliff. And just as they were about to throw him off of the cliff, God intervenes and allows him to walk away unharmed. Now, I want you to imagine a time in your life where you've had some good news to share with people. Whether it was getting a new job, or you're going to get married, or you're having a child, or something else along the lines of what we would call a major life event. And you go to the people that you respect and you love the most, the ones that have known you for so long, and you think that when you tell them this good news, they're going to be just bursting with joy to hear the good news that's going on in your life. You know, good for you. We're so happy for you. But when you tell them the news, what you get instead is the complete opposite response from them. Not only are those people not happy for you, they are so mad at you that they start to throw rocks at you. They chase you up to the top of the Shikalimi lookout, and they're going to throw you off the cliff. Because how dare you do the things that you told them you were going to do? Who do you think you are? 
Imagine how you would react to being treated this way. Do you think you would still be excited about what was going to happen in your life? Do you think you would begin to ask yourself this question? Have I made a mistake? Maybe I shouldn't take that job. Maybe I shouldn't get married. Maybe I shouldn't have that child. Is that what you would feel? Or do you think you would be able to look at those new opportunities and say, I don't care what the other people are saying. I know that this is right, and I'm going to carry on with or without them. Now, have you ever experienced this in your life, giving people what you believe is good news and getting a response back that is very negative? You know, one of the things that, uh, one of the sayings that I really like is that uh, the Bible, you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. And what that means is when you read scripture at times, it feels like it's speaking directly into your heart. It's like, this was written thousands of years ago, but in this moment right now in my life is exactly what is going on. And so as I was reading the scripture uh, and studying this week, and I was thinking about how Jesus must have felt giving that information to the people and then getting such a negative response from them, uh, it really spoke to me, and, and two examples in my life where this happened, they just came into my mind immediately. Now, the first time that this happened, when I thought I had good news for people, and it turned out that they did not feel that it was good news, was when Carlin and I made the decision to adopt Lily. Now, do not get me wrong. I am not saying that everyone in my life stood up and told us how bad of an idea it was to adopt her. There were many, many people that were very supportive. Many of you are in the room today. And they helped us to bring her home, and we are forever grateful to them. Yet though the response was by far a positive one when we decided to adopt, there were people in my life that wanted to tell me how bad of an idea that it was. Why are you adopting a child? You already have two. Isn't that enough? Now, those same people came back when Carlin was pregnant with Brenna, and they said, you really need to give up now on the adopting. You have three children. Isn't that a lot already? How will you ever deal with a fourth child? I heard things like this. Why are you adopting a child with special needs? Don't you think it'll be too hard to raise her? What will you do if she hates your family? What will you do if you have to give her back? You know, I know I've heard some people that had to return a child that they adopted because they didn't fit into their family. Why are you adopting a child from China? There are kids here in the United States that need adopted. You should adopt one of them. And what do you mean you have to go to China for three weeks in order to adopt her? That's not worth it. And how can you abandon your other children for so long? What kind of parents are you? Now, I couldn't understand how people could be so negative about what we felt was a calling from God. And it was uh, uh, something that caused lots of struggles in my life then. The second time that came to mind when I thought about how people reacted negatively to something I told them, that I th was excited about and thought was good was when I told people that I was going to pursue becoming a pastor. The responses I got were something like this. You? <laughs> You're going to be a pastor. Well, I guess they'll let anyone do it. You know you're going to lose a lot of money, right? Like, they don't get paid what you're making now. You know you can just... They can just move you and your family anywhere they want, whenever they want to. How is that fair to your children? And speaking of your children, you know that your family is going to be judged much more harshly than any others just because of your job, right? Don't you remember those pastor's kids when you were growing up? How when we got a little bit older, they all went crazy because they finally had freedom? You don't want that to happen to your kids. Don't you already have a good job? Why would you leave it? 
You see, in both of these instances, there was a calling that was placed upon our lives from God. And you can say that it was a calling on our family in both of these instances, because the decision to adopt and to become a pastor affected more than just me. And though we did experience some negative comments in our lives, we did not face the persecution that Jesus did. No one tried to run me out of town because of what we were doing. But sometimes, doesn't it feel like that to us? Whenever we make a decision to follow what God is calling us to, we can expect that there will be pushback from others. Indeed, the Lord tells us that we can expect to suffer for him. Now, that pushback, it can be out of genuine concern. They might be worried about us. And that is why we experience the pushback from them. Indeed, for me, in most cases, it was people that were just worried for us. But in some cases, there is a greater problem that is at play. And that is someone or something is trying to stop you from following what God has called you to. See, there is a problem that we face when making that decision to follow what we believe God is calling us to. And it is this, it is that we have to ask ourselves, are we truly following what God wants us to do? Or are we following what we want to do and trying to put God into it as well? See, in that case, we must pray for discernment. And that's a word that we throw around a lot in the pastoral circles. We're always saying, we're praying for discernment. We'll pray for your discernment. Well, what does that mean? Discernment means spiritual guidance. We are praying for spiritual guidance, or to come, for it to come into our minds and hearts. You see, it's necessary for us to pray and ask God to lead us in the direction that he wants us to go. And it's necessary for us to do that more than once. Indeed, we should be praying over all things and asking God where he, to lead us where he wills. And I can tell you that the decision to adopt and the decision to become a pastor were not done haphazardly. There was lots of praying, lots of discernments, and there were moments of doubt that needed to be swept away by the power of God. Now, perhaps you're listening this morning here or maybe online and you're uh, listening and it's striking a chord with you. Maybe you have been feeling a call upon your life. Well, I encourage you to be in prayer, to talk to those that you love and trust and ask them to pray for you as well. Listen for God's answer and do so patiently. You see, I know that each and every one of you has a calling on your life. And I will say that again. I know that each and every one of you has a calling on your life. You might be thinking to yourself, hey, pastor, don't put that on me. I have enough going on. You might be thinking to yourself that just hearing that God has a calling for you is a scary proposition. And you might be saying to yourself that you don't want it. No, thank you, pastor. Keep that calling to yourself. Well, you need to know that having a calling from God is not a punishment. It is not something to be feared. It should be a source of joy and strength in your life. It is not a curse to be called by God. It is a blessing. You see, when you follow what you are called to do by God, then you never have to wonder if you're living a life with purpose. When Jesus faced the ire of the people of his hometown, he wasn't deterred because he knew that his ministry was important. He knew that the Father had called him to be in that place and in that moment, and he knew that he would deliver him so that he would be able to take his message to others. Now I know the things we are called to, they are not on the same level as what Jesus was called to, but how could they be, right? Yet they are important. Anything that God calls us to is important to him, and if it's important to him, it should be important to us. You need to know that just like Jesus had a mission to light his way, so do we. And if you're asking yourself, well, I don't know what my mission is. I don't know what my calling is. I will remind you of 
that we all share one common calling, and it's found in Matthew 28, verse 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's a pretty good place for us to start when we think about what our mission and what our calling is from God. I'd like to ask you all a question. This church has a mission statement. What is this church's mission statement? Sharing the love of Jesus so others may know the way. Is that not a calling upon your life? Now, how we carry that ministry out to others, it looks different in all of our lives. In 1 Corinthians, we are told that we all have gifts, and they are all different kinds of gifts. But the same Spirit distributes them to us. So know that God has a calling upon your life. Know that he has already given you the gifts that you need through the Spirit in order to use them for his glory. He's just waiting for you to follow his calling. Amen. My challenge for you this week is this. It is a short one, but it is an important one. Say yes to what God is calling you to do.